Praise God. Well, how many glad to be alive today, anybody? Yeah. Glad to be in the land of the living, amen, and being a part of what God is doing. What the presence of the Lord sleep this morning, amen? Yeah. Uh, the goodness of God's presence and just being in His presence. And, uh, All right, John chapter 10, verse 27. We're going to continue, actually, we're going to wrap up a series that we started together entitled, Can You Hear Me Now? And we've been talking over the last three weeks uh, about the importance of hearing the voice of God. Uh, and I share with you that I literally just kind of had this mental image in my mind of the Lord in heaven leaning over the seal of heaven and saying, hey, can you hear me now? You know, that God is shouting out His voice for us to hear. And that God desperately longs for us to walk in intimacy and in union with Him. And that is really, as we've been talking about, it is impossible for you to have an intimate relationship with God if you are not hearing and discerning His voice. It is so critical that we hear the voice of God and that we know His voice that without it, we really find ourselves on the outside. And John chapter 10 verse 27 is an amazing verse. And we said that this verse really gives us a picture of Christianity. Jesus number one says, My sheep hear my voice. And we said that that simple declaration tells us, number one, that uh, if you've been born again, and you are a child of God, you've been born again by the Spirit of the Lord, then you have the capacity and the ability to hear the voice of God. And not only does it tell us that we have the ability to hear God's voice, but it also implies that Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. It implies that Jesus is speaking to His people. How many know God is not silent? Amen? Uh, God actually has a lot to say, and He is desiring to speak into our lives. So this verse says, My sheep hear my voice, and then it says, And I know them. And the one thing that you're going to hear continually at Liberty Church is simply this. Christianity is not about following rules and regulations. It is about a relationship with God. Amen? It's about following Jesus. We are following God. We are following His Son, Jesus Christ. And Christianity is about a relationship. And so God said, my sheep, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And then He says, and they follow me. We said the purpose of hearing is that hearing enables us to follow. And we looked on the very first week about what it meant to have a biblical shepherd over our lives. And we said, biblically, shepherds lead their flock. A shepherd never drives the flock. A shepherd always leads the flock. And so we said that Jesus literally calls us unto Himself and that when we hear His voice, what He literally does is He goes before us to prepare a place for us and then He calls us unto Himself. That's why you can honestly say that there is no safer place or better place to be than in the will of God. Why? Right? Because when you go where God calls you to go, you are entering into a place of God's provision. And the Bible says that He can even make a table before you in the presence of your enemies. God can prosper you in the midst of unfavorable circumstances. God can bless you in the midst of unbelievable opposition. And when the world seems to be rising against you, God can call you into the midst of the storm and there He can sustain you and cover you. Why? Because He always goes before us to prepare a place for us His children to come. And so learning to hear the voice of God is significant because God is not driving us by fear. God is not driving us by anxiety. God is never behind you with a whip trying to get you to do what He wants you to do. God is always in front of you beckoning and calling you to come to where He is because that is the greatest, safest, prosperous, most blessed place on the planet to be in the place of God's presence. And that's what His voice does. It calls us unto Himself. So we said, if we look at our next thought, we said that as Christians, that the success of our Christianity is really wrapped up in our ability to hear and discern the voice of God. And I believe this. I believe that most Christians are hearing God's voice, but unfortunately most Christians are not discerning that the voice they hear is the voice of God. And until you discern or recognize that it is God's voice, you're never going to have the confidence to step out in faith and go to some places maybe you've never go before unless you knew God was calling you there. Right? We're going to talk today about the Apostle Paul. And we're going to see how that Paul heard the voice of the Lord and that God was calling him to a place 
that in the flesh looked very uncomfortable and unfavorable to his, to his life. But it was actually a place of God's provision and a place of purpose. And because the Apostle Paul was listening and obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit, he found himself right where God wanted him to be. So, three ways that God speaks. We said, number one, that God speaks through His Word, the Bible. And this is critical and important and significant, and I want to just encourage you again that if you are not consistent in the Word of God, as we go as we go to the last week of our prayer and fasting, I want to encourage you, make a commitment this week to spend time every day in the Word. Make a commitment this week to say, you know what, I'm going to create a holy habit to study, to read, to memorize, to meditate, and to speak God's Word over my life. And I promise you this, if you'll commit to the Word, the Word of God will begin to speak into your life. So number one, God speaks through the Bible. Number two, we talked about it last week, God speaks through the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the most exciting elements of Christianity is because we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We said that the Holy Spirit speaks through spontaneous thought. That He gives us ideas and images and words and phrases that jump into our mind. And through those spontaneous thoughts, the Holy Spirit invites us to acknowledge Him. And the moment you acknowledge Him, that invitation becomes a communication where the Lord begins to unfold and unpackage His direction, His purpose, and His instruction for your life. But if you don't acknowledge the voice of the Holy Spirit, then you end up missing the fullness of what God is wanting to say and wanting to do in your life. And today, we're going to talk about the last element. Today, God speaks through other people. We're going to talk about how the Lord does it. How does God speak through other people? And, and let me just say this to you uh, as we look at this screen. Number one is so important that if you don't nail down number one and become committed to the Scripture, you're going to constantly struggle with number two and number three. Until you make a commitment to the Word of God, that you're going to spend time on a daily basis in the Word of God, until you make that commitment, really to make a decision, I'm going to become a student of the Word, you're going to constantly struggle with, am I hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit? And you're going to constantly struggle with discerning God's voice as He speaks to other people. So again, I just want to reiterate the significance of God's Word in our lives. Amen? Amen. Alright, so let's talk about how does God speak through other people. Three ways that God speaks through people. And in reality, there's 3,000 ways God is God and He can speak any way He wants to. Amen? But, I want to give you three practical ways that God speaks to other people. Number one, God speaks to authority. Number two, God speaks through wise counsel. And number three, God speaks through prophetic ministry. God speaks through authority. Several years ago, I had a young man, he was about 19, 20 years old, and his name was Daniel, and Daniel was excited about the Lord. He was excited about what he thought was God's plan and God's purpose for his life. And Daniel was zealous for God. But Daniel had a problem. And Daniel's problem was simply this. He did not want to submit to authority. He didn't want to submit to authority in his family. He didn't want to submit to authority on his job. He didn't want to submit to authority in the church. And so I sat down with him one day because I saw the potential in him. And I love this young man. I said, Daniel, I want to help you. But there is an overwhelming challenge in your life. And that challenge is that you are not submitting to authority in every area of your life. And he said, well, Pastor Keith, he said, I don't listen to the voice of man. I only listen to the voice of God. And I said, well, then you've got a problem. And the reason you have a problem is because Romans chapter 13 says this. Let every soul be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Look what it says. Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Why? Because God operates through authority. God speaks through authority. And God will use individuals in positions of authority, spiritual authority and natural authority, to bring direction correction and instruction in your life. How many of you parents, how many parents in the room today? If you're a parent, raise your hand. How many of you parents honestly know that if your kids would listen to your advice, things would be a whole lot better for them? Yeah. All right. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you parents are in the room uh, as adults now realize that if you would have listened to your parents' advice, you would have lived a better life? 
See, the reality is God speaks through authority. God speaks through parental authority. God speaks through spiritual authority. God speaks through authority. And when you look at the chain of command in Scripture, when God had a message for a nation, when God had a message for a nation, and He would give a prophet this word from God for a nation, you know who God would give that message to? The king. God always delivered the prophetic message to the man in charge. God always went to the top. Why? Because God understood that the key to him releasing his provision was to bring direction to the authority that was in charge. And so God would minister and speak to the authority because God knew that through authority he would minister what he wanted to do. And so one of the challenges that I've seen in people's lives, in all of our lives, is that many times we have a natural, sinful resistance to authority. And the fact that somebody tells us to do something, we just don't want to do it. I mean, just the fact, not that it's a bad thing, we just, somebody said, I want you to do this, and all of a sudden something rises up in us, I don't want to do that. I want you to understand, until we settle in our hearts a submission to God's authority, we will constantly struggle hearing God's voice. Because God speaks through authority. Let me, let me give you a little example. Me and Kelly, uh, we, we kind of laugh about this uh, because God uses Brother Curtis in our lives a lot. Kelly will say something to me and she'll say, Keith, I think, I think we ought to be doing this at the church. And I'll say, well, I don't know. I'm going to pray about that. And then I'll go to the church the next day or the next week and me and Brother Curtis will be talking. Brother Curtis will say, you know what, Pastor Keith? He said, I've been thinking, I really feel like we need to do this at the church. And it'll be exactly what Kelly said. And I'll say, man, that's a great idea. <laughs> and Kelly gives me that look. She just gave me right there. <laughs> have, you, have you noticed that sometimes you can tell your spouse and your kids something and somebody else can come in and tell them exactly what you've been telling them and somehow they receive it? But you know what? God works through authority. How many glad God works through authority? God speaks to the Lord. The second way God speaks, God speaks through wise counsel. God speaks through wise counsel. God will not only send people into your life to give you wise counsel, but I believe that God desires that we pursue wise counsel. I can say to you today, there is probably nothing more valuable than the pursuit of godly counsel. Now when I say godly counsel or wise counsel, I am actually talking about godly counsel or wise counsel. It amazes me how many people will take counsel from people that are not wise and not God. And so you've got to understand that God speaks through wise counsel. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 20, verse 19, or excuse me, verse 18 says, Plans are established by counsel. And by wise counsel, wage war. Plans are established by counsel. And by wise counsel, wage war. Proverbs 24, verse 6 says, For by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. God speaks through the voice of wise counsel. Now let me just say to you, let me give you a definition of wise counsel. Wise counsel is someone that is not on the same level as you but someone that is actually ahead of you. It's not somebody on the same level as you. It's somebody that is ahead of you. Wise counsel is actually counsel that comes from somebody that is actually doing the thing that you desire to do, operating in the thing that you desire to operate in, going to the places that you desire to go. Wise counsel is not necessarily asking your peers what do you think? Wise counsel is seeking individuals that have had the experience to do the things that you are desiring to do and have actually accomplished success in the realm that you desire success. Now there's a great story in the Bible about Rehoboam. Rehoboam was one of the kings of Israel. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And when Rehoboam stepped into authority as the king, the people of Israel came to him and they came with one cry. They said, please lie the load that your father placed upon us. Because your, your father, they said, has placed a heavy burden on us. We've been taxed and we have been oppressed to the point that we are no longer able to rise up under the burden that your father has placed on us. And they said, if you will just lie the load, we'll serve you forever. So Rehoboam 
gathers together the elders that had served with his father. And he asked the elders, what do I need to do? Now these were men that were older than him. These were men that had experience he did not have. They had actually served with his father, the king. And they said, you know what, Rehoboam? The people were right. The last few years, your father really pushed the limits a little bit too far. And if you would lighten the load off the nation of Israel, they'll serve you forever. Well, then Rehoboam ends up deciding to ask his peers, the guys that were on the same level with him, his friends that he went to school with, graduated college with, and he said, hey guys, what do y'all think I ought to do? And they said, let me tell you what y'all do. You shouldn't lighten the load. You should make the load heavier because you want them to know you are powerful. And you are strong. And you are mighty. You don't want them to think you're weak by locking the load. You want them to think you're strong by enforcing a heavier load. And so unfortunately, Rehoboam listens to the counsel of his peers instead of listening to the counsel of his elders. And the Bible says that the nation of Israel was rent in half and torn from his hands. And the nation of Israel was then divided into two nations. You had a northern and then a southern kingdom because the people revolted. And unfortunately, that is a picture of how most people seek counsel. Most people seek counsel from their peers instead of from their elders. Elder does not define age. Elder defines experience. An elder is somebody that has experienced the things you want to experience and are operating in the things you want to operate in. And if they are ahead of you, they are your elder, whether they're 20 years younger than you or not. And there is a huge challenge for us guys to realize that God speaks through wise counsel. And I recognize in my own life that when I don't want to ask my elders what they think, it is because I probably already know what they think and I don't want to do it. And so what happens many times is we sabotage our own success because we seek counsel, but we don't seek wise counsel. So we ask our peers who are on the same level with us who don't know anything that we don't know because they haven't experienced anything that we haven't experienced and they haven't gone anywhere that we haven't gone. And we say, well, what do you think? And they think whatever you think because they're your buddies. And in moments of decision, you don't need people that are going to tell you what you want to hear. You need people that are going to tell you what you need to hear. We need to seek wise counsel. And God speaks through counsel. Our plans, the Bible says, are established and prospered. So whenever you seek counsel, you and I need to look to people that have gone ahead of us. Amen? I heard a story. John Maxwell is one of my favorite authors and writers and speakers. And, and years ago, I was about 27, 28 years old, and I was listening to a message by John Maxwell, and he was talking about a young man that was about 22 years old, and he said this young man was sharp, said he was, he was committed to Christ, he had, he had submitted his life to the Lord at a young age, he was committed to growing and discipling, he said this was one of the sharpest 22-year-old young man he'd ever met. He said he had an advantage and an edge over most people his age. And he said, as I talked with this young man, he said, I was greatly impressed. And then he made this statement. He said, and I thought to myself, in 20 years, this boy will be a great leader. And when I was 28 years old and I heard that, my heart sunk. Oh. You mean, 20 years? He'd be 42. That's like old when you're 28. Right? I'm 43 now, so 42 is really young. And, and I remember thinking, oh God, I don't want to wait 20 years to be a great leader. And then the Lord spoke something to me that was critical in my life. He said, Keith, there is never a substitute for experience. All the schooling, all the reading, all the books, all the education is wonderful and we need it. But there is no substitute for experience. And there are some things you can't learn until you've lived long enough to experience it. And as a younger person, we need to understand all of us have elders and peers. All of us, no matter what your age. We all have elders and peers. We need to be wise enough to seek the experience and the wisdom of those who have gone before us. 
and not make the mistake of being Rehoboam and saying, well, I'm just going to listen to my peers and tell me what I want to hear and say what I want to say. That's powerful, guys. God speaks through wise counsel. Third, uh, last but not least, God speaks through prophetic ministry. I'll give you a couple of scriptures. Hosea 12, verse 13 says, By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet, he was preserved. So the Bible says that by a prophet, through the prophetic ministry, God brought Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Let me say to you today, prophetic ministry brings people out of bondage, but it also, look what he says, and by a prophet, he was preserved. God used the prophetic ministry not only to deliver the nation of Israel, but He also used it to sustain them and to ultimately usher them into the promise that God had for their life. Jeremiah 1 verse 4 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Verse 9 says, And then the Lord put His hand, put forth His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So what is prophetic ministry? Prophetic ministry is when somebody speaks for God. And it's a spiritual gift. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gift of prophecy is one of those gifts. And through the gift of prophecy, the Bible says we speak exhortation and encouragement and comfort to other people. And that we are able to speak through words of wisdom and words of knowledge, tell people things that are to come. Prophetic ministry is powerful. When somebody actually, by a gift of the Holy Spirit, will begin to speak a word from God into your life. And if you've never experienced prophetic ministry where somebody you didn't know began to speak things into your life that confirmed and affirmed what God had already been telling you, it is an amazing thing. Amen? And in just a couple of weeks, we're going to have a prophetic summit here at the church. And we're going to have Dr. Ray Self. We're going to have out of worship. We're going to have some teaching. He's going to teach on prophetic ministry in the church and how it operates in modern day America. And then we're going to have a time of prophetic prayer and ministries. We're going to pray and prophetically minister over folks. And you're going to have an opportunity to get a word from God. And it is powerful. And it is life changing. And all of those three ways, God speaks through authority, God speaks through wise counsel, God speaks through prophetic ministry. All three of those elements are divinely ushered and used by the hand of God. But let me give you this statement. God speaks through other people. Let me say it this way. God's word to you through other people is intended to be confirmation to what God has already said to you. God's word to you through other people is supposed to be confirmation of what God has already said to you. Because how many of you understand that God, Jesus said, John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. How many know if God wants to get a message to you, guess who he talks to first? You. Makes sense, doesn't it? If God wants to get a message to you, God speaks first to you. Now, sometimes God speaks to us, and because of fear or insecurity, or anxiety, or circumstance, many times we may not always respond to that word. And so then God will send a confirming voice, somebody that will come into your life through authority, wise counsel, or prophetic ministry, and they will confirm to you verbally what God has already spoken into your life. That is really the power of the prophetic ministry and that is really the power of God speaking through other people. When God speaks through other people, it is intended to bring affirmation and confirmation to confirm what God is, has already said to you. Why? Because when God wants to speak to you, He speaks first to you. And you need to grab that. Because that's significant and that's important. Because sometimes people want to get lazy. I've seen Christians in spirit-filled churches want to get lazy. And what do I mean by that? They will. They want somebody else to pray. They want somebody else to fast. They want somebody else to study. They want somebody else to seek God. And then they want to come get a word. Right? I want you to do all the work. And then I want to show up and get a good word from God from you. And you tell me what God says. And I'll go out and do it because I'm really... Really I'm interested in seeking God myself, but I really would like a word from Him. I want to challenge you today. God does not intend your life to operate that way. Prophetic words 
Words that God speaks into your life through other people, whether through authority, wise counsel, or prophetic ministry, are intended to be words of confirmation to affirm what God has already said into your life. Now, having said that, let's look at two ways that we really measure a word from God through other people. So two requirements for receiving a word from God through people. Because how many of you realize not everybody that speaks for God is from God? I heard a statement years ago, a gentleman made this statement. He said, when God wants to bless your life, He will send somebody into your life. And then he said, and when the devil wants to destroy your life, he will send somebody into your life. I can tell you because we're a Celebrate Recovery Church, almost every person that I've met talked to that got into deep addiction and became destroyed by a lifestyle of addiction. You can ask them, where did, the, where did things go wrong? And you know what they'll tell you? Every time they'll say, I started hanging out with the wrong people. I mean, I hear that every single time. How did you, how did you end up? In prison. How did you end up in a drug addict? How did you end up losing your family? How did you end up losing your house, your job, your everything? How did you do that? Well, I started hanging out with the wrong people. Why? Because when God wants to bless you, He'll send somebody into your life. When the devil wants to destroy you, He'll send somebody into your life. So we have got to know how to discern those voices. Is this the voice of God or is this the voice of the enemy? Because not everybody that speaks for God is from God. So two ways we can do that that are really pretty simple. Number one, you have to ask the question, does it line up with God's Word? Whatever they're telling you, whatever they're saying to you, does it line up with God's Word? Because we follow the Word of God, not signs, wonders, prosperity, or people. We follow the Word of God. Jesus is the living Word. He's given us the Bible, which is the written Word, and the written Word and the living Word bear witness one to another. God never contradicts His Word. And so, when somebody shares a word with you, and they say, well, I believe you need to do this, or I feel like the Lord said this, or I wanted to share this with you, before they start giving you instruction, correction, direction in your life, you need to, number one, ask this first question. Does what they say line up with the Word of God? Now, here's a good challenge. Because we are, as Christians, intended to follow Jesus, not stuff. See, we do not follow signs and wonders. Let me give you a great scripture. Deuteronomy 13. And this is important because I meet a lot of people. See, we are really, because we're spiritual beings, we like supernatural stuff. And we get excited about signs and wonders. We get excited about seeing things we've never seen and experiencing things we've never experienced. And it's like, oh man, that's amazing. Oh, that had to be God. And this was that and all that stuff. But I want you to see something. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1. It says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dream of dream who gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. So he says, if somebody is among you, and they say they're a prophet or a dream of dreams, and they give you a sign. So imagine they say, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, a stranger's going to walk up to you, and they're going to give you $100. And then tomorrow at 3 o'clock, a stranger walks up to you and gives you $100. You'd be like, oh man, that was amazing. That was, that was awesome. Tell me something again, right? I mean, I won't go right? Look well, what he said. If he gives you a sign or a wonder, if this dream or this prophet says that this is going to happen or this is going to happen or this is going to happen, God says, if what they say actually happens, look at this. Saying now, he says, he says, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, and then they say, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. Look what he says in verse 3. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet, the dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So he says, you know what? There are people that can give you a sign and a wonder. They say, this is going to happen and it'll happen. And then they'll say, you know what? You need to be doing this and you need to be doing that and you need to be going there and you need to be going there. And all of a sudden, you've got to say, hey, is what they're saying lining up with God's Word? Because he said, if they tell you to go and worship another God, they tell you to go and do something that my word, God says, says not to do. He says that you need to not listen to that prophet or that dreamer of dreams because they're not speaking for me. The Bible actually, in Mark chapter 16, says that signs and wonders should follow you as a believer. You should not follow the signs and wonders. See, it is very, you, we are very easily deceived when we start looking for signs. Because everything that is genuine, the devil will counterfeit. 
Everything that is genuine, the devil will counterfeit. Now, I'm not saying we don't need signs and wonders. I love signs and wonders. I love it when I get that sign and that wonder. The Lord says this and it happens and God says this and it comes just like He said it would. That is amazing and it's awesome. But if the word that they speak does not line up with the word of God, then no matter how many signs and wonders you see, don't listen to them. Because we don't follow signs and wonders. We follow Jesus. We don't follow prosperity. I wonder how many people have left a job that they love to go to another job that paid more money and then ended up being miserable. You ever heard of that? I have. I've heard people leaving a job they love to go to another job because it paid more money. Because we have this mentality. That for whatever reason, if I'm following God, following God always means that I'm going to be promoted to a higher level of financial prosperity. Let me tell you that it's not always true. The Apostle Paul, when he started following Jesus, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was on, on the Sanhedrin court. He was a leader among leaders. He was well respected. He was prosperous and he was blessed. And he ended up, after following Jesus, spending his life as a prisoner locked behind bars. And he was right where God was. <laughs> See, if you follow money, you will be easily deceived. See, it happens in the church. I know a lot of pastors that the thing that they use to define whether they go to a new church is, well, they offer me more money. Oh, they're giving me a raise. They're offering me more money. That's got to be God. No, it doesn't. If money, if prosperity equaled God, then the pornographic industry would be God's greatest discovery. Because it is a billion dollar industry. There is more money made through pornography than all major sports put together. And them boys make some big money. But the pornographic industry makes more money. Guess what? God is not in pornography. You can't follow money and assume that you're following God. Because let me tell you something that's more important than making more money. Being where God wants you to be. Amen. Having joy. Amen. Having peace. Actually being excited about getting up and going to work every day. That's more valuable than all the money in the world. Because that money will never make you happy. Amen. So we can't follow prosperity. Everything that grows does not signify that it's God, right? Sometimes cancer cells grow faster than healthy cells. So we cannot follow signs and wonders. We cannot follow prosperity. We have to follow Jesus. The last one, we don't follow people. We follow the Word of God and Jesus Christ. Let me give you a great scripture. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. Paul says, But even if we, talking about himself, the prophets, the apostles. Even if we are an angel from heaven and preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. <coughs> Guess what? Paul also said, follow me because I follow Christ. The criteria for following people is that those people are following Jesus. Paul said, if me or anybody else starts preaching another gospel to you, and we start straying away from the truth of Jesus Christ, and we start proclaiming a message that is not the message of God's Word, he said, then let that person be accursed. Don't follow the person. Follow Jesus. Amen. See, and the only way I can stand up here as your pastor and encourage you to follow me and follow the leadership of this church is because we are following Christ. And the moment we stop following Christ, you need to stop following us. Because that is the only thing that creates a validity in authority. And that is that a person is following Christ. So we don't follow signs. We don't follow wonders. We don't follow prosperity. And we don't even follow people. We follow God's Word. We follow Jesus Christ. Jesus said, follow me. The written word always leads us to the living word and always confirms who God is and what God wants to do in our lives. So every word that we receive from any person, no matter who they are, we measure it 
by the Scriptures. See, people sometimes get weird and flaky because they have a dream or a vision. They say, well, I saw this angel, or I saw this person, or I saw Grandma in my dream. She told me to do this. Let me tell you something. Just because you saw Grandma in her dream does not mean you need to do what Grandma said. I'm just, people, people do this stuff. Well, I saw Grandma in my dream, and Grandma told me this is what I need to do. If what Grandma said in your dream don't line up with the Word of God, you don't need to obey Grandma. Because the Bible teaches a thing about a thing called familiar spirits. You know what a familiar spirit is? A familiar spirit is a demonic spirit that appears familiar. See, if the devil appeared in your dream with, with, with horns on his head and a pitchfork running out, a pitchfork in his hand and a tail running out his backside, you'd say, oh, that's the devil. I don't want to listen to him. But if he appears in your dream like Grandma, you're like, oh, Grandma. Right? I'm just telling you, that's really how it works. Saved people are not coming back from the dead appearing to you. God will send an angel and the Holy Spirit will speak when God works through people. But if you start seeing visions of dead people and even of his grandma, just because his grandma won't make us go. Amen? Amen. Alright, we all clear? That's <laughs> one Big old grandma. I love you, grandma. Alright, number two. How do we know? How do we, how do we measure a word from people, whether it's a word from God? Number two, we, we ask this question, is there fruit? Does this person's life bear fruit that glorifies God, and are they modeling what they're telling you to do? Luke 6, 44, Jesus said this, every tree is known by its own fruit. Every tree is known by its own fruit. So when somebody gives you a word, the first thing you do is you measure that counsel by the word of God, and the second thing you do is you look at the person and you say, Does this person's bear, does this person's life bear fruit that glorifies God? You know, I ask myself, are they winning souls, making disciples, destroying the works of the devil? I ask myself, do they have the fruit of the Spirit? Are they walking in love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness? If they're mean as a junkyard dog, I don't want to take advice from them. If they're bitter and hateful and they're always speaking critical words about everybody, I don't want to take advice from them. I mean, because if they're being critical to you about somebody else, you can be sure they're being critical about you to somebody else. You can be sure. And so we got to ask ourselves, is there fruit? Is there fruit? Does this person's life glorify God? Do they have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Are they living a life that honors and glorifies Jesus? And then number two, are they modeling? Go back to that screen if we can. Are they modeling the advice they're giving you? It is amazing how people that have no money want to give financial advice to everybody around them. Are they modeling? Somebody's telling you to tithe, are they tithe? Somebody, somebody's telling you to, to do something, are they doing what they're telling you to do? Are they exemplifying the advice that they're giving you? Because if it's not good enough for them to do, why would you want to do it? And so we need to really ask ourselves those questions because it's really critical that we understand that we receive counsel from the right people. Again, it amazes me who people seek counsel from. It amazes me who people listen to. When it comes to relationships, you need to find somebody that has fruit on the tree. Their marriage is healthy and strong. They've raised godly kids. They, they have managed their money and they're financially stable. They've held down the same job for 25 years. They can give you how, advice on how to do it. You need to look for fruit. Fruit that glorifies God. And an example that they're modeling the thing that they're telling you to do. Alright. Let me give you next to our last thought here today. Prophecy is not a substitute for intimacy. And I said this last statement at the very beginning because I wanted to go ahead and give it to you up front. What others say, what other people say, should confirm what God has already said to you. Prophecy is not a substitute for intimacy. God desires me and you to be intimate with Him. God wants to speak to you first, right? And if you don't listen, 
or you're struggling out of fear or worry or whatever it is, God will bring a confirming word. God will bring affirmation to tell you you're on the right track and you're doing the right thing. But first of all, He wants to speak to you. How does God speak? Number one, through the Word. Number two, through the Holy Spirit. Those are the two first two voices of God in your life. And then God will speak through other people to confirm what He has already said to you through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. When I was just turned, well, I was 19 years old, and I was in the Word. I began to study the Bible. And when I started reading the Scripture, all of a sudden, every Scripture about somebody being called out to be a voice for God began to speak to me. And then God started giving me sermons and messages and all these things. And, and I mean, I was 19 years old, and I was, I was on spiritual overload. I mean, God was downloading things in me showing me things, speaking to me stuff. And it was amazing. And I was, I was astounded and I was scared. And all of a sudden I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to preach the gospel. I've called you to be a pastor and a preacher. And it scared me to death. It scared me. And so I began to pray. And so I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard confirmation from Scripture over and over in Scripture. I mean, the Scripture was coming alive about people being called in the ministry, called in the ministry, called in the ministry. And the Lord, without a doubt, was saying, Keith, I'm calling you in the ministry. Holy Spirit said, I've called you to pastor. I've called you to preach the gospel. And I was scared to death. And I said, Lord, I don't want to do it. I didn't like speaking in front of people. I was, I was not that person. And so it, six months went by, and I had just turned 20 years old. And Kelly and I were visiting around looking for a church to be a part of because this is where I came to. I said, okay, God, I don't want to preach. I don't want to pastor. But I realize I cannot be happy if I'm not serving you. So I want to serve you, God. So I said, Lord, put me anywhere you want to put me and just not preach and pastor. <laughs> and, and so we started looking for another church, the church we grew up in. Really, there wasn't any opportunities to serve. And so we started visiting around and we ended up going to uh, Fairview First United Methodist Church Pastor Brother Slater And so we went there First Sunday morning we went there and visited And they had Sunday night service So we went Sunday morning We came back Sunday night Sunday night we're walking out the door of the church Now my prayer is God put me somewhere you can use me As long as I don't have to pastor preach and, and I'm walking out the door of the church And he shakes my and Kelly's hand And he says hey Keith He knew me because I went to school with his daughter He said hey Keith he said, I need you, uh, I want to ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, well, I've been praying about starting a children's church ministry. And I felt like the Lord said, you're the one to do that. Would you be willing to start that ministry for us? I said, Brother Sutter, we've been here one day. <laughs> Today. This morning and tonight. He said, yeah, I know, but I believe you're the one. Now, all the while I'm thinking back my head, I've been praying, Lord, put it somewhere you can use me. And so here the Lord gives me first out there. He gives me an opportunity to start a children's church ministry. And uh, I said, well, I, I don't know what I'm saying. i got to pray about that. I'm not sure. And so we go home and we, we rock on there for a little while. So a month or so later, maybe, I'm not sure how long it was, uh, I made a point to go meet with him. And so he had me come over to his house on Saturday morning. And I was sitting in his living room on the couch talking to him. And I grew up Baptist, and this was a Methodist church. And... and, and my Baptist pastor basically said you can't, you couldn't be, if you weren't Baptist, you weren't right. So I was really scared, you know. So I'm like, well, I won't be right with God because I'm not going to be Baptist anymore. Lord, I don't want to go to hell because I'm a Methodist. And um, I'm telling you, that's what this 19 year old boy was thinking. You know? I was, I was, didn't want to go to hell because I was Methodist. And so I go meet with him and I'm talking to him and I'm asking him all these questions, you know, what's the difference? Da, 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 da. Basically realized, you know, really there wasn't a whole lot of difference. And, uh, I was going to go to hell for being Methodist, so that was a good thing. And, and so I got up, I shook his hand, I said, well, thank you, Brother Slater. I said, I'm going to go home and talk to Kelly. And I said, if we're here tomorrow morning, uh, I said, we want to join the church and become a part of uh, the church here. And uh, I have been praying now uh, in the last month since he had said that to me. The Lord has still been dealing with me about preaching. And I finally come to a place where I said, okay, God, if you want me to preach, you're going to have to tell somebody to tell me that you want me to preach. I've read the Word, I've heard the Word, I've heard the Holy Spirit, but I've just got to know that I know I need confirmation, God. I need you to tell somebody to tell me you want me to preach. So I get up, shake his hand, tell him that, and he says, well, I'll tell you what else you need to do. I said, what's that? He said, you need to announce your call to preach because I can tell God's called you. 
I mean, my mouth dropped open. I sat back down, talked to him for another hour, and uh, got up and, and left. And I prayed, I tell everybody, I prayed the stupidest prayer I've ever prayed in my life, and I prayed the most sincere prayer I've ever prayed in my life, and this was my prayer. On the way home, I said, okay, God, if this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. So if I wake up tomorrow morning, I'm going to announce my call to preach. If you don't want me to preach, don't let me wake up. <laughs> I don't recommend that to anybody. But that's exactly what I prayed. Just as sincere as I can. I mean, I was ready to die. I mean, I really was. <laughs> Praise God. By the grace of God, I woke up the next morning. And we went to church that morning. We joined the church. And I stood up in front of the little Memphis church. And I said, I believe I'm going to surrender to call to preach. I believe God's called me to preach. And uh, three weeks later, I preached my first sermon. And three weeks, three months later, they sent me to go pastor a bunch of people that didn't know what they were getting when they got me. And uh, so uh, that began our journey. But that word from him was confirmation. God had already said through the Holy Spirit, the Word had already said as God had quickened Scripture over and over in my heart. And what I needed was confirmation. I wasn't looking for direction. God had already given me direction. I was looking for confirmation to pursue the direction that God had for my life. Prophecy is not a substitute for intimacy. It is a confirmation of what God is already saying to you because you have a relationship with God. Now, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you. We're going to be ready to worship the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I believe those two or three witnesses should, number one, be the Word, number two, be the Holy Spirit, and number three, be the mouth of other people as God affirms and confirms. Now, let me give you a great, a great scripture right here. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Paul is speaking. He says, And see now that I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I want you to see what Paul said. Number one, verse 22, he said, I go bound in the Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit has already told me I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. So I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He said, you know what? I don't really know what's going to happen there, except, verse 23, look what it says. He said, except the Holy Spirit has already testified to me, everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit affirms to me that there are chains and tribulations that await me. He said, so I really don't know what to expect in Jerusalem. I don't really know what God's going to do in Jerusalem, except that when I get there, there's probably going to be chains and tribulations. And then verse 24, he says, But none of these things move me. He said, Nor do I count myself, my life here myself, so that I may finish the race with joy that God has called me to. Now look at verse uh, chapter 21, verse 8. He says, And on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and his feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those who were from that place pleaded with him, talking about Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, The, Lord, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went to Jerusalem. So I want you to see what happened. Paul said the Holy Spirit had already spoken to him, told him to go to Jerusalem. He said the only thing I knew when I got there is that the Holy Spirit had already told me there were going to be chains and bondages awaiting me. Now on the journey to Jerusalem, they come to Caesarea. And they're staying in Philip, one of the seven's house with his four daughters who are prophets, who prophets or prophets since they prophesy, the Bible says. And, and all of a sudden, several days later, a prophet named Agabus comes. 
And he comes in the house, and if you can imagine a Old Testament coat rack, all their coats are hanging by the door with their sashes and their belts, and he walks in the house, and he grabs a belt out of the pocket. And he walks into the room, and he ties his hands with it, and he ties his feet, and he says, this is what the Holy Spirit says is going to happen to the man that owns this belt. Now, he didn't know whose belt it was, but God knew whose belt it was. It was Paul's belt. And Paul knew it, and everybody else knew it. And all of a sudden, when he gave this prophetic word that whoever owned this belt was going to be bound in Jerusalem by the Jews and turned over to the Gentiles, everybody became afraid. And all of a sudden, they began to plead with Paul and say, please don't go to Jerusalem. Please don't go to Jerusalem. They began to weep and mourn, the Bible says, to such a point that Paul said, what are you doing? You're tearing my heart out, guys. But I've got to go to Jerusalem because I'm not only willing to be bound, I'm willing to die to do what God has called me to do. And I want you to see something. If Paul had not already heard from God, number one, he heard he was supposed to go to Jerusalem. Number two, he had already heard from God that when he got to Jerusalem, there was going to be tribulation, there was going to be change. If Paul did not have an intimate relationship with the Lord, if he had not already heard that, then when Agabus came in and gave that message, he would have responded just like everybody else responded. See, everybody else heard that word and they thought it was a warning. And they were saying, Paul don't go to Jerusalem, Paul don't go to Jerusalem, Paul don't go to Jerusalem. But when Paul heard that word, he didn't hear a warning. You know what he heard? He heard confirmation that what God had already told him was going to happen. He knew that the chains and bondage waited for him in Jerusalem, but he also knew that there, that was the place God had destined for him. And then the Holy Spirit said, Thank you. He said, Do you know what would have happened if Paul had not left to Jerusalem? I said, No, Lord, what? He said, Paul wrote two thirds of the New Testament because he was bound as a prisoner. He said, do you realize that if he had not been placed under arrest, instead of writing the letters, he would have just went and preached those messages to those people. He said, so instead of Paul going and preaching them, and those words dying on the ears of the people that heard it, he said, because he was bound, he wasn't able to go and preach, so he had to do the next best thing, and he had to write letters. And God said as he was writing those letters, I was strategically putting together what would be called the New Testament. And I was placing something in your hand that 2,000 years later, you can now stand on and know thus saith the Lord. Because Paul had heard from God. But if he hadn't been intimate with the Lord, he would have responded the same way everybody else responded. Oh, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul said, oh, no, i got to go to Jerusalem. That's not a warning. That's a confirmation that I'm right where God wants me to be and I'm doing right what God wants me to do. Because everywhere God leads you is not always comfortable for your flesh, by the way. But it is always profitable for the Spirit. See, God's using us to build something bigger than our financial portfolio. God is using us to build His kingdom that's going to last forever and ever and ever. It was intimacy that allowed Paul to re receive confirmation through prophecy. That word that seemed to scare everybody else didn't scare Paul, it encouraged him. Because he had an intimate relationship with the Lord. Last thought, we're going we're gonna to worship. Go ahead and let's our praise team come up here. For our prayer team, go ahead and make your way up front. I want you to hear this. God wants me to you. He wants us to hear His voice. So we've got to make a commitment that we are going to draw near. Draw near and listen. James chapter 4, verse 8, it's on the screen. The Bible says this, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. I want to encourage you this morning. God wants you to hear His voice. And prophecy is amazing. And in just a couple of weeks, we're going to have a prophetic summit. We're going to see some unbelievable things that God is going to say and do. But I want you to understand, prophecy is not a substitute for intimacy. God wants you to hear His voice.
And I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you're here today and maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you're standing on the outside looking in saying, I wonder what this Christianity is all about. And today I believe the Holy Spirit is tugging at people's hearts. And He's calling people to come. And He's inviting you to come to Him. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, you're saved, and maybe you're living closer to God than you've ever lived. But you also recognize there's more that God has for you. No matter where you are today, in your Christian walk, James 4 8 applies to us. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. He's calling us this morning to a place of intimacy. And when we walk in intimacy, the prophecy comes, and it's amazing, and it confirms, and it affirms, and it helps us do what God has called us to do. Without intimacy, prophecy can sometimes be confusing. I've seen people get confused. So like, well, I don't understand. This person said this and this person said that. When you hear from God first, then everything else gets filtered by His Word and by His Spirit. And then those words become affirmation that help us.